very much for coming. Uh, I'd like, first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, Sorry. Patricia Yuswala. So, uh, a little bit about Trish. Uh, Trish was an AP World History scholar in my class back in 2011. 11? Yeah, 2011. <laughs> um, and then she graduated, obviously, in 2013. She was accepted immediately into uh, UCLA's School of Nursing to do a Bachelor of Science in Nursing, a four-year program. Graduated... 2017. 2017, thank you for the dates, yeah, uh, 2017, and uh, started her career in nursing as an ICU surgical nurse with a specialization in cancer... Liver. Liver, sorry. <laughs> liver. Yes, liver. Liver transplant. That's it. Yeah, liver transplant. Um, she's still kind of working, but is more focused on her. So, handing it over to Isabella and uh, Emma for a moment. Oh, Mr. K. Oh, I guess he was going to do the slides, but if you guys could do it after. Thank you so much for coming. It means a lot to us since it's our first year and our first um, speaker event. And we wish you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. We want to say thank you to Patricia for being here. And thank you, Mr. Kelly. Um, honestly, it's really great to see some of you guys here. Thank you so much again. Uh, we can't wait. You got it? You're on. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Trish, as you guys already know. Um, and I'm here to talk to you guys today about being an ICU nurse and kind of my journey as to how I was able to get here. You can go ahead, next slide. So you got a little bit about my background. That's me, I graduated from the UCLA School of Nursing back in 2017, and I actually come from a long line of nurses as I'm Filipino and it's my birthright. Uh, my grandma was a nurse in the Philippines, and then my mom is a nurse, but she works on the administration side. And nursing was actually like not even really my first choice. It was kind of something I was playing around with um, while I was in your guys' seat at the time. Um, and I'll tell you guys a little bit more about how I got there. So this is the kind of place that I work at. As you can see, there's a lot of machines and a lot of things that are going on in this picture, but this was actually one of the things that really brought me into nursing. I liked that there was a lot of autonomy, meaning I had a lot of say in what was going on with my patients. I was taking care of really, really sick people, and I liked that I was able to really make a contribution to what was going on with any of my patients to be able to talk to doctors and help make decisions with them, not like they were just telling me orders and I was like, okay, yeah, that's cool. Um, so this is the kind of ICU that I work in. Um, so as I said, nursing wasn't originally my first choice. I was like, mm, I don't really know if nurses really get to do a lot. Like, I feel like they just, I, I didn't really know what they did actually when I was in your guys' shoes. And so I wasn't sure if it was for me because like I said, I wanted a lot more collaboration with doctors. I wanted to have a lot more say in what was going on with my patients. And I wasn't sure if nursing would really offer me that route. I knew for a fact that my parents wanted me to do nursing just because they knew it was a really safe route, something that I would be able to make money in after getting out of high school and after going into college. And I really was honestly more of a creative person than being, being someone that was in STEM in the sciences. And so I was like, is nursing really for me? So my path to nursing in high school, like I said, I graduated in 2013. I was really involved. Um, I was actually in ASB. I was vice president my senior year. And during that time, I volunteered at uh, Providence Tarzana. I think now they're partnered with Cedars. And I worked in various departments from spiritual care all the way down to medical records to pathology. Um, it was over there that I met a doctor that I could shadow. And he actually helped me write my letter of rec to get into to the UCLA School of Nursing. And while I was in high school as well, I was really involved. I tried to, I was in volleyball. I did that for three years. I swam for two years and I was involved in many clubs. Um, I was involved in Cool Kids Club. I started a club, which I think that's a great initiative that you guys are doing. Um, and I was also in ASB. And I think the most important thing to know about that is that I didn't just do these things for one year. I tried to make sure that I was involved in these clubs for at least two or more years. So for the longevity of my time in high school, and this is where I made all my friends. And just as an FYI, these clubs don't have to be medically related. You can always kind of swing it in a way that helps with whatever sort of major that 
that you want to do in the future. And you can swing that in a way where you're like, I started a club and it was, that's my leadership initiative, or this is how I was able to make an impact on the community. This is how I was able to bring diversity into what I was doing. So there's many ways to swing a club if you guys are involved. You don't have to be in like a medical or um, a specific club to your major. So pre-college, I found programs that weren't pre-nursing, meaning when I was applying for nursing programs, if the school had nursing, I was obviously gonna apply to that. Um, but there are schools that have programs that are pre-nursing, which is you get admitted into a college, and then when you're in college, you have to apply into the nursing program. Whereas there's other programs like UCLA where you are already gonna be in the nursing program when you start. And so it's just up to you to do that research if that's what you wanna do. But the main reason for me picking UCLA was that I knew that I wasn't having to compete for a spot in nursing. Like when I got in, I was already in. The drawback to that is that for UCLA, when you apply into the nursing program, it's all or nothing. So you apply, you select, I'm going to UCLA and this is my major that I want. And if you don't get into the nursing program, then you forfeit all chances of getting into UCLA. And that was really intense because we only had 40 kids in my program at the time getting into the UCLA program. But I, I always say that if, it's, if that's what your dream is, like don't let counselors or anybody tell you, okay, that's a small percentage. Cause I did have friends in my class that didn't even apply to UCLA just because they thought, oh, there's such a small, amount of people that are getting in like why why would I why would my grades make a difference but honestly it's like your belief in yourself that's really going to make all the difference for you being able to get into these programs so because of that I wrote two admissions essays one to UCLA and then one that was specific to the school of nursing I think now they still have similar guidelines but it might be a little bit different but UCLA school will have a specific why nursing and then they'll have other initiatives I think now it's like on diversity and community and then I also had to hand in a resume so that's where I wrote all the things that I did in high school and then two letters of rec I think I got one from Mr. Guante and maybe Mr. Kelly you wrote me one but someone um, someone from here <laughs> wrote me a letter and that's why I got in. So make sure it's someone who really knows you um, because I actually ended up having three letters of rec that were written. And since I only had to turn in two, I was able to actually kind of sneak a peek and take a look at wh whose essay I didn't end up using. And they totally wrote me one for a different program that was not nursing. And can you imagine if I turned that in and then the reader's reading it and is like, oh, it says engineering, but she's here for nursing. So make sure that these are people or uh, teachers or counselors that you absolutely trust um, to be able to have this letter for you. And then in college, I was involved in a few clubs consistently, some of which were nursing based, Alpha Tau Delta and nursing students at UCLA. And these are just programs to get involved in the community, whether it's volunteering or also just like meeting and networking with um, other nurses in different places. Actually, as a graduate, I use the same presentation to speak to the nursing California Nursing Students Association as well. So you make, you build on those connections and these are definitely things you can put on your resume if you're ever going back to school for something else or like me doing a doctorate degree. I also did my preceptorship in an ICU setting, meaning once I was in the program, to become an ICU nurse, you need ICU experience as a student. So what I did was th that my last set of clinicals as a nursing student, I picked ICU because my program didn't have a specific ICU training for everybody. I just had to be like, hey, I wanna eventually go into the ICU, so I'm gonna take a chance and I'm gonna ask you guys to place me into an ICU setting before I graduate and hopefully that'll, that'll be the case and then I'll be able to become an ICU nurse after that. And then I found professors that were mentors that again could write letters of rec for me in the future and that was also really helpful. So establishing those network settings is gonna be really great. I would say that it's not gonna be like high school, especially now if some of you guys are close to the teachers here, it's a little bit harder in college because you don't see your professors as much but maybe having them be a chair of your club or just being more involved like sitting at the front of the room answering questions might be your in to be able to have these professors write for you because the more they know about you in the future, the more they can write and not just give you a generic letter that they would give to everybody else. 
And now I'm in postgrad. Um, so it took me six years to get here. Um, during the time that you saw that, I graduated. I was a nurse for six years now, and I have been in the ICU my whole time. Um, and then I, last year, during around this time, I applied uh, to CRNA school, which is Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetist, or Nurse Anesthesia School. And what I'm going to be doing now after this program is I'll be putting people to sleep for surgeries, I'll be treating their pain in pain clinics, and I'll be working anywhere that an anesthetist or an anesthesiologist is needed. Um, this is a really cool program, also kind of pretty prestigious like UCLA. There's only five programs in California and only two of them are in LA County. The third one is in San Bernardino, like Loma Linda. And then there's two that are, one, one's in Fresno and then one's up north. Um, there's only 24 of us and um, this is a three-year program, so I'll be able to get my doctoral degree, which is a terminal degree. So there's no other degree I can get above this unless I'm outside of nursing or getting a PhD. Um, but this is kind of really a really cool program to be in, and it builds on my ICU experience because you need that critical care experience to be able to take care of patients, and when something goes wrong, to be able to react immediately. Otherwise, it's a really chill job, and you can just sit back and once your patient is out. So why ICU nursing and how did I get into this specialty? So I showed you this picture and you're probably looking at it and saying there's a lot of stuff going on. I already told you guys that, like I said, I wanted a really big impact on what was going on with my patients and how they were gonna do. So on a day to day, I have really sick patients in the ICU. Um, I work primarily with liver transplant patients, meaning that when their liver is not going, doing well, they are oftentimes on ventilators, so they have a breathing tube in. They have all these IV pumps for blood pressure medications to keep their blood pressure up. And that machine, that green one right there, is a dialysis machine that is continually cycling. So as a nurse, I manage all of these in a day-to-day -day basis while looking at the monitor behind them and making sure that all of these things are running. Um, and I think that this is a different perspective than what a doctor's would do, because doctors kind of manage the oversight of everything and they have multiple patients. But but as a nurse, I'm at the bedside making the different meticulous changes that's going on with this patient to keep this patient alive um, in a moment by moment kind of time. Other points that I didn't, don't think I touched on, I wanted, I wanted something where I could highly advocate for the patient and in this way, I'm able to really understand what's going on with my patient the way a doctor would, but also in the sense of like, I'm making those changes, titrating the pumps and really kind of saying, hey, I really think that there's something wrong that's going on with this patient, can you check it out? And telling the doctor that because they can't be there since they have like 50 patients that they need to manage. This was actually a picture of me. I got floated from my liver transplant ICU into the COVID ICU during the pandemic. So I did work as a COVID nurse for a little bit um, during my stay. And that was really interesting to see a, a different subset of patients and be on the front lines for that. How did I get into this specialty? So you can go into any specialty right after nursing school, but specifically to become an ICU nurse, you need to have ICU shadow experience. So as I said, I volunteered at the, um, I, I volunteered at the local hospital to get into nursing school, but then within nursing school, I had ICU experience through my clinical sites. And in that time, I had over 300 hours in the ICU so that when I applied for a job, they can say, okay, we know that you work in the ICU, then you know what we can consider you for this job. It's hard to come in as a nurse not having experience into the ICU and then just jumping straight in because the learning curve is really steep. Um, to give you guys an example, in nursing school, you learn just the generic of everything that you might need to know, whether that's for OB or any other specialty, but I work in a really specialized ICU that deals just with liver and they can't teach you everything about that in a textbook. So really you're learning on the job, but it magnifies the skill that you it builds on top of the skills that you learn within your um, tenure at school. And then, yeah, I think that's all. Yep. yep. Okay, so now let's talk about the fun stuff. So you're like, okay, I don't really know if I wanna do nursing based off of what you're saying. What are some nursing perks? So I, as a nurse, only worked three shifts a week. I only worked 12 hours, which sounds like an awful long time, but when you get four days off, this is great. This means that I get to travel the world. That's actually a picture of me this last um, February. I was in the Dolomites. I was in Europe for three weeks, actually. And I think I only used like 
maybe three, three work days worth of like vacation time and the rest was just because I could work at the beginning of one week. Um, I only used three 12 hour shifts and then I could work at the end of another week. So it was three, three weeks being in Europe and I only used three days of um, vacation time. And um, that happens a lot actually, where I'll work at the beginning of one week and then I'll travel somewhere and then I'll go um, and work the end of a second week. And as a nurse, you get a lot of flexibility. You can schedule when you work. So my hospital is really cool where you can pick, you can work all of your days in a row. You can work one day, take off the next day, work the next day. So there's a lot of flexibility in that. And let's say you wanna take a small five day vacation, you can do the same thing. Schedule your three shifts, X out five days so that they can't schedule you and then work the next three. It's really up to you. I also got a lot of opportunities to network and be in part of creative projects. So um, I've done some YouTube videos on nursing um, if you're ever interested. And then with that, I worked with Sigma Theta Tau, which is a nursing honor society to um, make videos with them as well and be part of their, the motherboard, not just the local level um, Sigma Theta Tau. There's also different avenues of nursing. I have a classmate where she went to nursing school and then she decided like, I wanna be a lawyer. So I think she's, in, she's like a lawyer for nurses now, but she went back to school after to do that. Um, you can also become a travel nurse. I have friends that travel nurse as far as Guam because uh, Guam is a US territory. And then for how much schooling you do, you get paid a pretty good amount. I think my starting salary as a new grad, I think on paper, it's like, it was like 80, 85K, but then I think in my first year, year and a half, I think I was making over 100K already. So there's a lot for how much schooling you do, the payout's really good. And then you can just like add on, work over time, you know, make money. And as travel nurses, travel nurses get paid a lot too. So lots of different avenues. You don't have to just work bedside, but bedside's gonna be your launching point for you to be able to do other avenues of nursing, whether that's, work um, as a nurse in format, formaticist, which is when they work with data or you know, you can create your own brand. And some people are like, they build like nursing YouTube websites and they help put people through nursing school. Just like if you've heard of Ninja Nerd for medical people, there's also like nursing people who do that as well. So there's a lot of different avenues for nursing and you really network with a bunch of different people to be able to get into these avenues that may not just be bedside if bedside's not where you wanna end up. Now I'm just gonna walk you through like what my typical workday would be like. Um, so a workday for me looks like I get report at 7 a.m. from the past nurse and that can be anywhere from 7 to 7.30 in the ICU. California's cool because you get protected where you don't really get a lot of patients um, and it should be just a manageable load. So in the ICU, you get two patients for one nurse. If they're really sick, it's one to one. And then in the, in the floor, I think it's four patients for one nurse as well. Um, so I'll get report from the night RN and then basically they'll tell me what's going on. After that, I will do a read through from 7.30 to eight to just make sure and take a look at the chart and make sure that everything's there. Um, during that time, I might have to round with the doctor. So the doctors will actually come by and ask me um, what happened overnight? Like, was there anything significant? We'll do a run through and I'll ask for all my orders. And the really cool thing on my floor is that I as the nurse, I'm the one that's doing that. So. It's like when you are looking at residents that go to med school, they're like, usually will be the ones to do that. But on my specific floor, I'm the one that's being like, hey, this is what happened last night. These are the orders that I need, um, which is a really helpful skill because now that I'm back in school, I'll be having to present my anesthesia patients um, the way med, med students have to as well. And then from um, eight to 8.30, I'll do my meds and uh, my first pass of meds and I'll do my assessment on my patients. And we do our assessments every four hours. So we'll do it at eight, 12, and then at four. Um, this is what I talked about. We do nurse-led rounds and we'll talk about the significant events in the systems overnight and then we'll or they'll order any interventions and it's actually a pretty cohesive back and forth. It's not just like the, or the doctor's like, yeah, just do this. It's like sometimes you as the, the nurse that's in that specific specialty may have a better subset of knowledge because some of the residents could be pretty new. It could be their first rotation that they're on and so you really have a lot to be able to help them and give back in that way and you really know your patients when you do. Every 
every day is different. Sometimes I'll be traveling for a CT scan or going to go bring it, and it's you and your patient that's going to go down there to bring them into the CT scanner. So you really have to know your patient and be able to act if something happens to them. Um, and then after that, before I got into getting to the ICU, um, so the rest of my day was just assessments and you kind of, like I said, every day is different repeating on that. Um, but I work from seven, usually until seven, and then I give report from seven to 7.30. And then, like I said, it's three 12 hour shifts. So getting into the ICU, I touched on this a little bit, but there's different ways to do it. Basically, before you are done with your program, you can do a nurse externship. This is like external from your from your grad program, you have to really kind of search up like where are, where are hospitals that will take uh, different college students in and then be able to show you different types of ICU because when you start out, it's not just one ICU. As you guys know, I work in the liver transplant, but they have cardiac ICU, they have neuro ICU, they have medical ICU, and those all have different specialties and they have their own um, special things that you have to learn about them that they don't teach you about in nursing school. Um, you also can volunteer. A lot of people in college volunteered and I recommend that you guys as high school students, if this is kind of something that you're interested in, to volunteer to see if this is something that you wanna do. The downsides to volunteering is when you volunteer as a student or even like if you're in college, it's really hard to see what ICU nurses do. Like you probably think they're just on the computer all the time or they're just staring at their patient, but there's a lot of mental work that goes on behind the scenes that is really hard Hard to kind of explain in the moment, but if you ask the nurse, they might be able to walk you through their process of what they're doing. And then preceptorship, like I said, I did 300 hours in the liver transplant ICU, and I was really strategic to do that because I knew that my classmates didn't want liver. They wanted cardiac and they wanted neuro, and I was like, well, if I get into liver, then I know I can get myself a job there. And so also being strategic, I would say, plays a role into that. And I got really fortunate that I was put in liver because I was like, I don't really know what liver transplant nurses do. Like we're surgical nurses, meaning we get a lot of patients from surgery and we bring a lot of patients to surgery. But I think liver out of all of the ICUs is we get the sickest patients, meaning they're really bloody. They're always, for the most part, intubated. They have um, a lot of drips, IV drips that they're on. And I think that's really cool because I'm always critically thinking, I'm always on my feet and I'm never bored at work. And I think that's a really helpful skill now because I know that in times of like, if someone codes or if someone's really in distress, I can act upon it without being scared to like that. I don't know what I'm talking about. And then seek out resources. If your preceptor, if your preceptorship doesn't offer ICU experience, cause some nursing programs won't. So make sure you know which ones you want to go into. Try looking at other places and seeing if they allow you to shadow there. I had a friend where he went to like a different college and they only offered him a random community hospital. And he was like, hey, I work at UCLA as a care partner, which is a nurse aide. Can I go and shadow and precept there? And then he was able to get a spot there. And then network, talking to different nurses to see what kind of, what kind of nursing that they do and maybe watch videos on the specialties. So if you guys have any questions that I don't answer today, totally, you can reach out to me. Um, this is like one of the certifications that you can get while you're an ICU nurse and um, I'm not going to take too much time about this, but basically this is a special certification that you can get after 1.5 years of clinical hours in the ICU. Uh, this is just to say that you need this to be able to get into CRNA school. So a lot of ICU nurses will do this. And then if you're in a different type of um, nursing, you can get your own special certification for that. But the ICU nurses need this one specifically. Okay, what I wish I knew before starting is that the learning curve for ICU and in general just to go into nursing school is really tough. Um, it's 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 hard to really know everything, um, but and it can be very fast paced and it's overwhelming. But really, if you just kind of ask questions and really try to understand like what's going on before you jump into like a specialty or jump into nursing, then that, that will really help you decide like, is this right for you? Also be your most authentic self, ask questions, um, even if you don't know the answer and you can't learn everything in one day. And then basically just 
when you're there, when you're applying to different programs, make sure that you ask them like, what, how long is this program? Am I pre-nursing, nursing? And really getting an insight into what goes on in the day-to-days. There's a lot of people that maybe are sitting in your shoes that they're like, I don't know if I wanna do med school or if I wanna do, or like pre-bio to go into med school or nursing. Make sure that you can distinguish what they do because they're very different. And if you go on one pathway, it's not like you can't go back to the other, but they're just very different specialties. So knowing the differences about that and just having a good attitude and being flexible if you guys don't end up right in the school that you want to at first, know that that's not a no, that's kind of just redirection for you to find a different path and that might be a skill that you can add to your resume before you get to your final destination. These are just some orgs that I'm in. So I wanted to touch on the one that's all the way to your guys' is right. This is diversity and nurse anesthesia. Um, I feel like this relates to your club a lot because this was a mentorship program that I went into before I became um, a nurse anesthesia resident. And it was really cool. It was started by this um, lady who wanted more diversity in the workforce. And so she holds a conference every year and she actually brought all the directors of the different anesthesia programs. I think there's only like 120 programs to show their um, numbers of their students. And of course, across the board, a lot of the students were white and she wanted to show like there should be more diversity in anesthesia and we should foster these pathways for different people. But I think oftentimes you don't hear about these programs until you're really far into nursing. And so people that might be really good at this job in the subset don't even know that this is a specialty of nursing that is available um, for you guys to have. So that, that was a program that I was in that really kind of fostered the diversity and really brought on resources to kind of help uh, get people who are of, uh, people of color into these programs through different interview prep, resume preps, and um, letters preps. So just like some professional organizations that, through nursing that I'm in. Um, and that's really it. That was all for me. Um, there's my email if you have any questions or anything. And then my YouTube, uh, it has a lot of new grad resources on how I got into nursing school. Um, so yeah. Thanks. Okay, uh, questions. Question, so you said um, emotional situations that, and how did I deal with it in terms of work? Um, I think it's, I think that's a really good question. I think there's different ways to deal with it. I think one is to really, well, it depends on the context of emotional, but if it's like more like it's high stress, I think it's taking a step back for me and looking at the bigger picture. Like, how can I help? If I know that I'm a new grad and like, I'm trying to run a code, I'm not going to be the one that's like, Hey, I'm going to bark out orders. Cause I don't know. Right. It's more like stepping back and seeing like, how can I help? Or let's say, um, they teach you this thing when you're a new nurse, it's called crucial conversations and it's how to approach a situation with um, kind of like some like gentleness to be able to like get your point across but also be respectful and I think in a way that's a way for people to be vulnerable right it's it's, it's vulnerable to be like hey I need this done but like to not kind of step on someone's toes and be a jerk about it you know but it's a way of like being able to communicate that that's like very direct, but then also taking a step back and being like, how can I support? And it's not here to turn against you. It's just here to be like, this is what I need. How can I support you? And how can we work together as a team is really kind of the way to go about it. They teach you a lot more about that in nursing school or as you start, like let's say you're concerned, like if a doctor is doing something and you're like, oh my gosh, this is unsafe for the patient. You say, we call it the cuss method. And you say, I'm concerned, this seems unsafe or I'm uncomfortable, this is a safety issue. And so that's a, it's C, U and S. And that's like your way of saying that. There's other ways to say that too. I always, when I don't know what's going on, instead of being on the defensive, like for a doctor, I always try to approach it with curiosity. Like, hey, I'm just curious, like why did you decide to order this instead of that and then they'll usually give you a response and then that gives you a voice to have a dialogue versus like versus being like oh you didn't why didn't you order this you know so it's just like approaching it gently and um, being direct and standing up for yourself and knowing what it is that you need and just having that run through the back because at the end of the day it's like patient safety right and so as long as everybody's being respected in that sense um, then I think that's the best way to go about it good question